Welcome back to the Niles Mia podcast. We uh, this week we have um, Walter Bernasiak from our Channel Awesome on the show. He's here to talk about um, all of his early work, feature films like Noir. I'm still here. Short films like Direction and um, his web series The Infinity Trinity, and his shows Batman, Twilight Tober Zone, Awesome Comics, Top Five and um, fanscription so um enjoy this is a very good talk and uh i think you'll find it interesting thank you Hi, uh, hi, Walter. Welcome to the show. Uh, hi, how's it going? Pretty good. Um, so, if you're not familiar with what I do here, where I interview artists that I like, and I go through a deep dive through their their life and their work, and uh, try to find the central themes in their work. So, uh, first of all, I want to congratulate you for what you for your last uh, Twilight Tober Zone. That was uh, incredible. I loved the whole demo reel aspect to it. Oh, thanks, thanks. Yeah, it took a lot to put together. <laughs> yeah. Was um, there's been recently like a lot of um, uh, talk about demo reel on YouTube. There was this long video essay that came out like back in the summer. Uh, did that have anything? That, has like this renewed interest in demo reel? Was that like the inspiration to do that? No, I I didn't know about that until after. I think um, the creator like tweeted something about like our teaser. I was like, oh no, demo reel is coming back or something. Uh, <laughs> But um, I didn't watch the video. It was like almost an hour, and I was, I yeah, I, I was hard at work on the the actual show, so I didn't get a chance to watch that yet. Um, I'm not sure if I'll check it out or not. But uh, yeah, I know a lot of people don't like demo reel, so <laughs> it's probably not like the most positive review of it. Yeah, I, it, it's it's a very interesting uh, take on it. Uh, but I, I just thought it was interesting this this idea where it was like that video came out, then like a couple other ones came out, and then this happened, and I was just like, what, what's What's this renewed interest in demo reel all of a sudden? <laughs> it's just, uh, I think what's old is new again kind of thing, probably. I, I didn't like base it off of seeing any other people talk about it. I just thought, um, I, honestly, I didn't think that they would let me do it because I, I asked uh, Doug and Rob and I, I thought for sure they would say no because I had like a backup um, idea for the skits and stuff that we were going to do. But I was like, let me just ask them about the demo reel thing because I think it would be fun and unexpected and weird. So let me see what they say. And they actually were all for it. And I was like, really? <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> well, let's do yeah. it then. Is this just like a one-off thing or do you plan on doing more with like that idea? With Demo Reel? I don't think so. Um, I think that was just a one-off thing. I'll probably put a compilation of all those scenes together on my personal channel at some point soon. Um, and I was talking to Jim about, um, Jim J. Roz, that is, about possibly doing like a little commentary thing about how we did some of the effects and like camera stuff with it. But um no, I think like for Twilight Tober Zone, every year is kind of a different thing. Like last year is kind of about kind of about like isolationism and everything that was happening with uh, COVID. This year was demo reel. I don't know what we're going to do next year, but um, I don't have any plans of doing any more stuff. But, you know, I didn't make demo reels. So maybe they'll <laughs> maybe uh, Doug and Rob will have something in the future. Yeah, maybe. Um, so let's go. Let's go. Let's go back to the, like um, like your childhood. Like so like you, um, from what I've heard, you grew up in Chicago. Yeah, like the south suburbs of Chicago, uh, pretty close to the the city boundaries and stuff. So, yeah, uh, yeah. It, was, it was it was a good it was a good childhood. I've never talked about it like this before. So, <laughs> oh yeah, good. no, I, of... I'm not gonna be like you know like trauma or anything. I was just like, so you grew up in the, like the suburbs of Chicago. Like, mm -hmm. was it like a like a a, a place that like kind of like sparked creativity for you, or it was like one of those like things where it was like you were kind of in the middle of nowhere and like you just had to create to like entertain yourself uh um well i was in i grew up in calumet city um which i guess is kind of a claim to fame is that it's like the hometown of the blues brothers and like in the movie they mention it and uh i think they mentioned it in like silence of the lambs or something too so that's i guess like the only claim to fame cal city has but um 
yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like uh, nothing going on. It was, I, I grew up with a big extended family. So I always had cousins around my age and younger and, um, a lot of friends to play with and everything. So I never was really, um, bored in that way. Um, but it was always about, I always had a thing for creating or writing or drawing. Drawing was a big thing when I was younger. Um, I still love to draw. I just don't really have much time to do it nowadays. Um, so that's kind of where it first came out was drawing. And like my uncle, um, would tell us like he was from South Dakota. So he'd come in once, uh, you know, like once a year during the summer and we'd stay at my grandma's house and he would like, like around a fire, like he'd make up like these spooky stories. And that always captured my interest. And that was around the same time that like goosebumps and are you afraid of the dark was on. And like, you know, the spooky kid thing was really, you know, kind of in vogue, I guess, back then. So like I I would write like little stories. I think I still have one somewhere called like the basement. And I wrote like a little spooky story about my basement when I was like six or seven. (laughs) Um, But um, yeah, I always wanted to like make something Um, like I I wasn't able to start editing until I was high school age because I didn't have the, you know, computer technology for any of that stuff yet. Um, So like that's more when we started shooting stuff. My, My best friend, Harry Locke. And my other friend, Dan, uh, Danny Grenchek, um, like during high school, we started to, to make more stuff. And that's kind of what snowballed into what I get to do now. Yeah, I've, I, I did some d- digging and I found uh, the the DX Super Kick safety video. Oh, was, God. Which was, which was, uh, <laughs> I think great. I have that up somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. And I also found the uh, the Rocky three reenactment. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's yeah. that was for a high school project. Yeah, it, it, it's very it's it's very good because like I mean I remember doing uh, high school projects like that and I was nowhere near that level at, at that time you know. Oh really? <laughs> um, yeah, I thought uh, Rocky was like I love Rocky, so that, I mean I've, I've always loved Rocky, so that was kind of a a fun thing to do. When my teacher said that we had to like recreate a scene and shoot it just like the movie, I was like, well, I'm gonna do a Rocky scene. <laughs> so. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, Rocky was also one of my early interests. I remember back when I was like a little kid, uh, when Rocky six was coming out, uh, so oh, I was yeah. probably like 12 years old or something. I mm-hmm. remember obsessively watching the Rocky movies over and over again for like that whole year until it came out. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, I was the same way. I mean, uh, I think I was, what was that? 2006. I was uh, just a couple of years older than that, but, uh, pretty close to the same age. So I, I grew up since I was like eight, I think, um, just loving Rocky and like, um, I'm half Italian. Like my mom's side is hundred percent Italian. So like kind of have that sort of connection to it too. Mm-hmm. Um, so just growing up with that, my uncles were like huge fans of, of Rocky when they were younger and stuff too. So like when Rocky Balboa was coming out, like I went with like a lot of my family cousins, my uncles, my grandpa, and we all went to see Rocky Balboa together. Um, so that, yeah, that was a big moment. I, I loved uh, getting to experience that with them. Yeah. Um, speaking of your family, I know your your family appears in your films all the time. Uh, like they're 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 all throughout the Infinity Trinity. They're in Noir and in, I'm still here. Um, mm-hmm. Are any of them also like involved in the arts like you are? Like, do, uh, are any of them other like aspiring writers? Do you have like an uncle that's like uh, like like a theater person or musician, or whatever? Um, well, my dad um, is a pretty creative guy, but he doesn't really explore that side of his. Uh personality anymore <laughs> i used to he used to play drums um for um a lot of different bands used to live in california and would do a lot of different um more creative things he never like was interested in movie filmmaking or anything like that but his his music was his thing um so he was big into that for a long time um my uncle john who um was the the uncle who came by once a year from south dakota um he is a professor at uh, I think University of South Dakota. I think that's what it is. Um, and he's like a, um, a photography professor and he's like big into photography and um, has been recognized by a few like bigger uh, entities and things for his work with that. So he's more of the creative side of things. His son, my cousin, um, Byron, uh, travels around and does shoot some some of his own things. But I think that's more like documentary type work. Um mm. But yeah, like we do have some, there's some creativity uh, around in the family, but no one's ever like pursued filmmaking specifically. Um, I have a younger cousin who like did it for fun, but didn't like do it professionally or didn't try to do it professionally. Um, So yeah, we all have our different, you know, creative outlets. My brother uh, plays the drums like my dad did and everything. So 
my brother draws really well, but he doesn't do it anymore, which always frustrates me. <laughs> but yeah. uh yeah, uh yeah, we all have that gene somewhere in us. Um, but yeah, I think I'm the first one to really try and make films at yeah. this point. Yeah, um that's it's always interesting because like I also grew up in a family that wasn't like a hundred like no one really pursued film in my family either. And but mm-hmm. it's so I always find it interesting of why someone decides to pursue it and i know that you've said that you were very influenced by christopher nolan and um mm-hmm. like 90s pop culture is is you know like the are you afraid of the dark kind of like sparks but what was the moment where you were just like you know what i could like i could make movies like this is what i could what i, what I want to do i don't know if there's ever like a specific moment i i grew up loving movies and tv shows and you know i, I never thought i could make them it was never like a like, yeah, I'm going to do that when I grew up. I just didn't know where you would start with that kind of thing. Um, I do remember watching Batman Begins and being like enthralled with like the behind the scenes uh, extra features on the, the uh, DVD I had because um, they had like really long extended featurettes about how they did a bunch of stuff uh, from that movie. And just I remember like marveling at like the scale of everything like they built, like all of the narrows from gotham city in this like warehouse and i was like oh i can never do like that's huge that's like a gigantic thing um but then as you know more movies came out that i saw that i was really into um i I just was thinking more and more like maybe we could like do like a small little thing um since we have equipment and access to cameras and stuff at my high school at that point um, and that's when my my friend Harry started uh, making some films for a couple of his classes that I wasn't in, but I was helping out on some of the productions. Um, and he was thinking way bigger. So like the first thing we did was like a noir, which was the first thing we really tried to do. That was a film, which was a feature, which was a mistake. We should have done <laughs> some shorts before that. Yeah. Um, but uh, it definitely ta- taught us a lot of different lessons about um you know, how hard it is to make a film, even something as low budget as that. Um, So yeah, that, that's kind of where it it sparked for me. It wasn't until high school that I really was thinking maybe I could actually do this. Yeah. How did you meet Harry and Danny? Cause like they're so integral into your early work. So it's like, Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, They're, we're still really close friends. Uh, Harry, I met in second grade, I think (laughs) Uh, we just grew up together. Um, all throughout grade school and high school. Um, he went to Ohio state for undergrad and we still kept in touch. I like visited him all the time and he went to USC actually. So he's, he's out there in LA, like trying to make it happen for real, for real, (laughs) um, right now. So, um, I get to visit him and like go to different sets and, you know, when he's able to work on something once in a while. So, um, yeah, that, that's, it's always been his passion just the same as it is mine. Um, Danny, I met in high school. Um, he was a part of the the group when Harry was making those uh, like class assignment films for his a uh, couple of his classes. So I met him through that, and we hit it off pretty well. And uh, I still talk to him uh, quite a bit too. So yeah, and then you guys formed the Power Trio. Uh, that's what the company yeah. was called. Yeah, Power Trio. <laughs> yeah. Productions Studios. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I've watched Noir. I watched it twice in preparation for this. Um, where did, oh, where did the <laughs> I, I made I made I had I made a, a bunch of short noirs in my, in my day. Um, mm. Like so, where did like the idea come from? And like I, one of the things that struck me was like, why not shoot it in black and white? This the um, or like this in, like because I know you start off the film in black and white, and then it goes into color, and then it goes back to black and white. I think at the end. Yeah, I think um, those were all of Harry's decisions. I mean, he like we all directed it quote unquote, but it was Harry's main idea. He edited everything. So um, I think he was trying to like, there was some theme to like the black and white scenes or the, the scenes that have like that different filter over them. That's like kind of orange. Um, I can't exactly remember what the connecting uh, theme was, but there was like some rhyme and reason to, why it was set up that way. I just don't remember exactly what it was. And I, I'm sure he doesn't exactly remember either now, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean like that whole idea, like when we first tried to do that, I think we shot like two or three times before we actually were shooting stuff that we could use. Um, we had like several different story ideas and 
like Harry always thinks very big. So, I mean, he was talking about like, oh, we're going to, we're going to have the character walk out of a flaming church and all this stuff like that. How are we going to do that? <laughs> all that stuff. <laughs> like we're like 17 years old, 16 years old. Um, so a lot of things would have to get scaled back. And then eventually we just took this um, kind of ad lib approach to everything. So we had the idea of where we wanted to go with the scene. And we, and, uh, it's pretty obvious probably that we just kind of rolled with the, the back and forth dialogue that we had. We didn't really, you know, specifically write out scenes when it came to the finale, like the, uh, the final version of what we shot. Yeah. I, I remember I found uh, somewhere on YouTube. I, it was the, the making of Noir and. Uh, oh, is that up somewhere? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and it was like, I remember you guys, you guys mentioning that you didn't shoot with a script. And I think it's only obvious that, like, if you know with, with, with that knowledge, because, mm-hmm. like, I remember a friend that I, I mean, I, my, a friend of mine made a short film where he didn't shoot with the script. He had, like, so this, like, these, like, A, B, and C has to happen in said scene and then blah, 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 blah. blah. But then mm-hmm. when the film came out, like, the movie's incomprehensible. Uh. <laughs> but with this, it's, like, it's actually comprehensible. Like, I, I know what's happening. And, like, I, like, um, like I, I get what I get what Hunter Vegas is going through, and I understand what like Branson issues issues are. And I I gotta say, like your performance in there is actually pretty good for being seventeen years old, not working with the script on your first movie. Oh well, thanks. <laughs> like yeah, I mean it it was a lot of, I mean it was definitely like really stressful trying to put that together. Um, because like I said, we we had tried several times and and couldn't make it work before we finally started shooting usable stuff. So yeah. that was a really long process. And we learned a whole bunch about, you know, like you need to have a, a group of people that you trust um, that are reliable to get through things. And um, yeah, we, we learned that the hard way a couple of times, but yeah. um, that's why we, you know, we like Carrie wasn't even going to be Hunter Vegas uh, at one point, um, but we just couldn't get anyone else to consistently be there. So he was like, well, I'm just going to do it, whatever. Um, so it, it worked out like for our first, you know, attempt at doing stuff like it, it worked out pretty well. Um, I looking back on it now, I it's, it's hard for me to watch sometimes. It's like, oh, God, you know, like this, this is so this, this, this or that is just kind of embarrassing or like, what were we thinking here or there? But um, at the time, you know, the, uh, we none of our other friends had really done something like that. And we like were able to premiere it at our school with like a bunch of our family and friends. And that was like a big deal for us. So um yeah, that, that's a, a time that I always look back on fondly, that we were learning different things and being able to experiment with how we're making that kind of stuff. And it, it all turned out pretty decent in the end. Yeah. Um, what was like the biggest challenge? How long did the film take to like make? It was like a whole summer? Oh, man. Uh, I'm trying to remember here. I think, oh, man, I, we the, like the last day of shooting was the day before. I think Harry left for Ohio state. <laughs> like we, we were right up, up to the very finish line with that. Um, so it was like throughout that whole summer of 2007, I think, I think like throughout that whole summer is the stuff that we actually use, but we were trying to shoot stuff before then. Like, like in the, if, eh, was it like fall? I know, I know it was like the year before we were trying to make it happen. It just wasn't working. So starting from, like I think the spring to summer to late summer of 2007 is when we were shooting. And then Harry went to Ohio state had access to, I think final cut pro six or seven and was able to edit it at school. And then eventually we were able to screen it uh, back home at our high school. Yeah. And you guys sold DVDs for it to try to make a profit, right? Yeah. I mean, I think we, we sold a few, I think it's interesting because like a few people like bought it from like Canada or something. And I was like, what, who, who's buying this? Like, how do they even know? <laughs> about this? Um, but we, he did mail out a few DVDs to like Canada and like different parts of the country, but it was, I mean, obviously very small numbers and a lot of friends bought, uh, you know, like copies of the DVD, but yeah, it, uh, it was interesting to see they've actually sold a few of those. Yeah. Well, like, so like, um, when did you make that the final decision to did not shoot with the script? Because I know I remember in the documentary, Harry says like the original script was like three hundred something pages long. Yeah, <laughs> that's all Harry. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he, uh, he he wanted to make this big grand epic, which is great. It's just I think you know we we went back a few times to say like maybe we should reshoot certain parts, 
um, with what we know now, you know, with some of the scripts that Harry developed for that universe, because he still he, he was writing a, a ton. So his imagination was just like far beyond what we could actually accomplish. I think it was just the running and gunning of like having to get it done by a certain, we had to get it done before he left for school. Cause we don't know what was going to happen. I like, you know, we all intended to stay in touch, but you never know what's going to happen when people go away to college and things. So um, Danny was going, I think to New Mexico or something. Uh, he was going far away too. And I was staying around the Chicago area. So we were all three of us were splitting up and we had to get it done before we left. So I think that may have been part of the decision to like, let's just have the bullet points. So we, you know, we got to hurry up and do this. Um, certain scenes I think are scripted out or I think the scene with, uh, Danny's character and, um, the, uh, what's I get with the main girl, her name's, her name was Sarah Evans when we were shooting, but I don't remember the character's name. Um, the blonde girl. Um, I know we scripted out that scene. Danny wrote that scene specifically. Um, but I think it was more of a, a time thing. We were, we were shooting at like three o'clock in the morning in like Hammond, Indiana, which is a pretty not safe place to be <laughs> um, <laughs> that late at night that we were approached by all of these, like these people who were clearly on drugs a few times. Um, and it got a little touch and go some, some of the time, but like some of the, the backgrounds uh, and the, uh, the locations we use just look too good to not shoot there. Like the, there's that big tunnel. I don't know if you remember, or that might've been, I'm still here. We used it as well. Um, this big uh, like brick tunnel that kind of led out into um, the downtown area of Hammond. Um, yeah. That's where Hunter you know, kills that guy, I think. Yes. Right. Right. I think that's the intro. Right. Uh, yeah. We use that again in our, our next feature. Cause it just looked really cool. Like, like Hammond, Indiana is not nearly as big as Chicago, but at one point it was a pretty substantial city. So there's all these, you know, there's not exactly a ton of skyscrapers, but there's a lot of like cool downtown sort of urban areas. And uh, we use that to our full advantage, but also, you know, we kind of paid the price for that because we were always approached by people who unsavory types. And uh, <laughs> one, one person I remember who was clearly in his forties trying to tell us that he was the captain of the football and basketball team at Florida state university. And we were very confused. <laughs> Uh, this person was clearly uh, not in his, his right mind, yeah. but um, yeah, I mean, you just can't like, I, I can't believe we did some of that stuff. Just like, Oh, geez. <laughs> like we, we were lucky. We made it out without getting hurt in a couple of those situations. Yeah. Um, I mean, what, what's really impressive about like, like your, your work is like how noir comes off as like the, is like this, like really, um, it's really, it's really small, low budget. It's very like a lot of times it's one shot and that's it. And then mm -hmm. all of it, when you did your next feature, I'm still here. Like the, ambi like the ambition is like increased, like by like a hundred percent. Like, it's just like, it, it, it just feels like you, you like, you guys like put like, you're like, you know what? Fuck it. We're going to put everything we possibly can into this one movie. Mm -hmm. And like, it really pays off. Was this like, was this one? Cause like, no, you said Noir was more of Harry's passion project. Was this one more of your passion project is like, yeah, that, that was my original story that I wrote um, that, that probably that fall or whatever going into the summer. Cause we were talking about, let's do another one during the summer um, when, when Harry and Danny came back to visit. Um, Cause they were, they were going to come back for the summer and they had jobs, you know, before they went back to school the following fall. So like we had like three months and like, yeah, let's do it again. Um, and uh, so like we decided it was going to be a story that I was going to write. So I had an idea for that, which was very personal. Like I remember looking back on that and, and thinking like, hey, this is just way too close to home. Like that's kind of the things you figure out as, you know, you sort of mature as a writer or, you know, creator of any kind is that you never want to have things too close to what's in reality. Cause a lot of that stuff was, kind of really happening like a lot of people in my hometown in Calumet City were moving away um I was even my my immediate family moved um moved a, away at that point to um a, a different city and I was just living with my dad uh in Calumet City still so just me and him and like all of my friends had gone to college and stuff and it was just a really lonely weird time <laughs> where I was going to Columbia College uh or Columbia yeah Columbia College downtown in Chicago um, I didn't know anybody. So it was kind of like the emo part of my, uh, you know, post high school life. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that stuff was like very 
very close to home. And like I said, a little bit too much. So when I look back on it now, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that was something that I, that I put together. Uh, the first version of that script was like 70 something pages, but Harry wanted to beef it up. Uh, he wanted to go a little bit bigger with certain things. So he like, you know, took it and like beefed it up and it was like an even longer script. <laughs> so I think it was like over two hours. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how long I'm still here is, but uh, the script was really long after he got a hold of it. Yeah. So. I mean, I think, uh, I think that the, the hyper personal aspects that you were describing actually really come off and they really actually elevate the film. I think that it comes across in your performance where, um, I, I think that you do like your character does have like this bitterness that everything is changing around him in the beginning. And I mm -hmm. feel like it's, it, it feels so real. And then like the, 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 the optimism at the end, like because of like, I guess like what you were going through, it really like um, hits home. And I, I, I think mm -hmm. I, I think I'm still here is actually a really great movie. Personally. Oh, wow. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I, yeah, I was. I, that's actually very interesting because I, I think that you like. Uh, I noticed that in your work that it, 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 a lot of your characters do feel very personal, mm -hmm. especially the ones that you play. Like, w were you always going to play uh, Losephine the whole the, from the start? Yeah, I was always going to play that character. Um, yeah, it, it, Harry wasn't going to be the um, the uh, the Perez, the bad guy too. I think he like we switched that after a while to for he he really wanted to play Perez at first he was going to be the Tommy character um like my friend who's like not actually there by the end spoilers <laughs> um, yeah. but uh yeah like so some things got switched around with that uh, uh, Danny was always going to play the um the cop character the undercover cop character um but yeah I mean yeah I was always going to play the the Jason Lowson fiend character yeah I I really one of my my favorite one of my favorite um parts of that film is the is like the way you hint at tommy not being alive mm. like when you first talk to tommy is he, you're talking about how he's left town he's like yeah i live in a gated community now and it's very nice right i, I thought that that was like brilliant really yeah, <laughs> yeah I thought, I, I, looking yeah. back at it it's like i'm like oh man that's definitely like it feels like heavy-handed i haven't watched it in a few years it's been a while so i don't know maybe I, it ages I, better but I think it's subtle if you don't know. I think I'll, I think on a rewatch it would probably be a little silly, but I think and, mm. and when you're thinking back to it after your first watch, it's just like oh, that's it's like it's like the um, whenever I, I I talk to writers about uh, like foreshadowing, I always think of the Reservoir Dogs thing. Oh, where, okay. Uh, where like uh, it's like you're saying something, but you're not directly saying it. It's like the, when right. um, when the the uh, the head of the the crime guy is like, who didn't tip? And Mr. Orange is the one who said he didn't tip because he's a rat. It's like you're right. saying you're saying in the movie without like you're saying with like the twist without have like saying it, which is like, right. You're I think foreshadowing things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, on this one, you also did the black and white to color um thing. Um, I, I was right. wondering like was that a re like uh, a reference to anything the, the in particular in this one since you wrote this one or um, I think um. I think again, like it's sort of like uh, noir. And when I was saying earlier about that orange effect, I think I was talking about this one, not noir. Because <laughs> um, I think there's like a black and white, but it's got like a tinge of orange to it, I think, or something. Um, I think Harry called it like the rust effect. I think that was just when, after I got beat up and when we were following my scenes, it, that that is when that black and white type of um, filter was put on it. Um and yeah, I think that kind of led up to the end where I think things come into color at one point, like on screen, it changes from that to full color at some point. It's been, yeah. a, it's been a while since I've seen it. It's when you put the mask on. Right. There yeah. you go. So, um, yeah, I think that's a little bit more clear about, you know, what, what the themes are, you know, he kind of finds a purpose, but it's not a great purpose, but still it's a direction. And then, you know, th things sort of come into focus for him as, as the the color comes back into his parts of the movie, yeah, there's definitely like um, uh, an influence on comic book writing in this movie. Uh, how much has sure. comic books like influenced you as a writer, or is it not even comic books, or just like like Batman the Animated Series or the Tim Burton movies or whatever? Yeah, I mean, um, I love Batman the Animated Series. I mean, I obviously, do the the Bat May every every May. We you know we're covering every single episode. Um, but yeah, I grew up watching that since just about its original run. I was very young when the it was originally airing, but um, I came into it before that original run ended. So 
Um, and of course they replayed it like all the time when I was growing up. Um, absolutely love that show. So it, yeah, I mean, there, there are definitely influences in like the dark parts of character development and how you show things and like deep shadows and heavy characters um, that definitely had a big impact on how I write those kind of characters and situations when I, you know, get a chance to do something like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, like Batman was always, I mean, I love Spider-Man too. Spider-Man's great. Um, but Batman always has like the richest, you know, sort of narratives um, going on, not just with Batman, but with like, you know, his, his uh, rogues gallery and with all the people that help the him Bat out, family. the Bat family. Yeah. Uh, like Alfred's one of my favorite comic book characters ever. I love Alfred. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, yeah, they definitely had a big influence on when I try to take that angle on things. And I guess you could see that influence in like in some of the fan scription stuff I do, um, you know, with Batman or darker characters, you could see that, uh, you know, more on obvious display than in, you know, personal works. Yeah, I actually like, now that like, I, I've, been, I, I've said it, I think I, I like thinking back to I'm still here. I see tonally that you're going for or th- there's definitely like. Uh, a, a vibe of like two specific episodes that I am desperately trying to remember the name of. I think it's uh, it's never too late. Is that the one with but the priest and the oh. gangster? Yeah, that's one of my favorite ones. Yeah. And then um, is it I am the night? Is that the one where um, Gordon gets shot? Yeah. 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 That 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 one because I think that you ha- you definitely have that when um the 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 like the lead cop uh, gets killed and and uh and I'm still here. I definitely have like a lot of like. Not direct references, but almost just like subtle, like homages to the Batman the Animated Series. Yeah, I mean, I could see that for sure, I, especially with um, "It's Never Too Late." Like that's just, I absolutely love that story. And Batman's barely in it, and it's about like these two brothers and just how I've always been fascinated about how you can someone could grow up together but become completely separate people. That's always fascinating. Fascinated me. Um, so like that's definitely on full display and it's never too late and has been prominent in a lot of my work, even up to infinity Trinity and stuff. Yeah. But, yeah. uh, but yeah. Um, yeah, I'm still here. It definitely has that, that influence. Um, it's not always on purpose, you know, it's just kind of baked into my, you know, quote unquote creative DNA, I guess mm-hmm. is a buzzword people like to say. Um, but yeah, I, I could see what you mean with, with those. Um, you know, the, the killing of uh, officer Leonard, um, was not even supposed to happen. That was like <laughs> a last minute thing because the actor we got, um, who we went to high school with, and I knew even before high school, I played baseball with him growing up um, in like little league. Uh, he uh, he kept bringing. That's it's kind of like an inside thing. I don't know like how much exactly I should say, but he we were supposed to do more with him. He brought like his girlfriend to set. And that didn't go over well. And he ended up not being able to finish <laughs> what we needed him to finish. So we ended up killing him off a little bit earlier than we wanted to. Yeah. But so. I mean, sometimes it's a blessing in disguise because I think it worked with sure. the film. Um, yeah, it definitely worked. It worked. Yeah. Are, are you proud of this one? Or, um, or would you consider it like if you if like if you had like the budget, would you like remake this one? Because it's like it's like so epic in scope. I took notes on a, a sequel to I'm Still Here like a year or two after I made it. Um, and I don't exactly remember what I wrote down, <laughs> but, um, it was, it, yeah, I definitely had ideas to like do more with it or, you know, at some point do, uh, you know, come back to it in some form. But I think at this point, like a lot of those themes have just shown up in other things that I've done that aren't exactly the same story. So I don't think we'll go back to it in terms of like a sequel or a remake or anything, but a lot of the ideas from it, I still you know, like implement in some work that I do or, or write. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, and in, in both Noir and I'm Still Here and even in the Infinity Tree, there's definitely like a, a religious like overtone into and in, in, in a lot of it is like that, like an important part of like your creative process where it's just like, because I, I, I always find um, writing about religion to be kind of like interesting where someone's just like devotion and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I think it creates really cool character moments. Is that something you consciously do or is it like a subconscious thing? No, it's definitely a conscious thing. I, I grew up Catholic. My family's very Catholic. 
So um, on both sides of my family. So um, that's always been ingrained in me since before I was born. <laughs> um, mm. So uh, yeah, just the, like the Catholic imagery and um, some of those beliefs and, you know, the sort of the guilt that comes along with some of those things um, is definitely a part of who I am. So show, I, I try not to like, put it in there too much. I think that it, it, it's in more of my early work than stuff that's in there that, that I make now, but I'm still here. It's very obvious, you know, there's obvious religious symbolism and um, imagery in that one. And also that's because um, St. Andrews is where we shot that, you know, all the church scenes in Navarre and I'm still here. And I wanted to get infinity for it, but we couldn't get in there for infinity training, unfortunately for the, uh, the wedding scene. But um yeah, it's it's a almost a cathedral type church. It's huge. That's where I went to school. That's where Harry and I met. Um, so that church uh, was a big part of you know me growing up, and it's like beautiful, gorgeous um, looking church from the outside and the inside. So um, I re- I think part of it was just like we got to use the inside of the church. It looks so cool. We got we got to use it somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that came into it. Um, superficially uh, just for looks and also with the Jason Lonesafine character, him having that like stubborn faith um, and sort of staying in the same place and not evolving was part of, you know, his character arc. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so was, was there going to be a third power trio project? Because I know that yeah. Noir was, was Dan- uh, Harry's and this was uh, mm-hmm. Walt yours. And then the third one would have been Danny's. Yeah. The third one would have been Danny's. Well, I, I tried. To, to get him to uh to write it it was going to be called sugar which um basically was like very loosely what the movie limitless that uh bradley cooper made was but this was like before that movie came out so i think after the movie came out danny was kind of down about it and then didn't you know adapt it or finish the script it was pretty interesting i mean it was definitely in the vein of i'm still here in noir and like it would have been like the next evolution of that um, I tried to help him along with the script and eventually he did put something out. But like I said, because of that limitless movie, it, it, uh, it never, you know, came to fruition. I would still love to, to make that try. I try to get him to like, even if you want to make like a scene from it or a short film or like whatever, I'd still do it. Um, but he's not, uh, it doesn't, doesn't seem like he really wants to to dig back into that as much anymore. Mm, that's fair. Um, mm-hmm. The next film that I was able to find in like your evolution was um, a short film called Direction. Yeah, um, this one feels uh, even more like vulnerable and autobiographical than um, I'm Still Here. Yeah, it's definitely like the next step inward from I'm Still Here. <laughs> um, that was the first project I, I got to make when I was going to college. So I was an undergrad um, on like a you know filmmaking type track at at the college and uh i was able to make something by myself so this is without harry and danny the first project that that i I really made and um it's kind of just when i look back on that one it's it's a little like even more like you said vulnerable that i'm still here like it's just like a raw nerve and i feel like it's a little it like for me it's just too close like it's too personal so i i'm glad if other people have seen that and like it or can connect with it but that's another one that's like oh man it's like way too close to what was really happening and a lot of those themes are still there and um you know you know from i'm still here and have evolved a little bit but uh yeah it wasn't um it, i i just would rather separate myself a little bit to make it more accessible to other people or something that i can watch later <laughs> Um, but I was proud of that for sure, because it was the first one that I made that I edited, um, wrote and directed all by myself. So, um, yeah, I'm happy with, with how that one turned out overall. Yeah. Um, well, so you said it's, 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 it's very personal. I won't dig too much into that one. Um, but I do have one question. Was the, uh, was that the, like a DVD store, DVD store that you worked at and were they pissed that you were making, basically making a movie about how, uh, it, it sucks to work at a DVD store? <laughs> Oh no. Uh, so no, that, that was uh, a friend of mine. Um, Mike Dozier who played, uh, the Valentine character in noir, the bald guy. Um, he worked there. Um, and he let me shoot there. Uh, I think we went in before they opened or after they closed or something. Um, but that was, 
definitely like a Kevin Smith influence. I think like before that I was, you know, introduced to clerks and, you know, a lot of his movies. So a lot of that dialogue and those situations were very Kevin Smith inspired. Um, and it's plainly plain to see if you know that, like if I, you know, if I told someone that and then they watched the movie, they'd be like, Oh yeah, I could totally see that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where that, that all came from, but they weren't, no, they weren't mad about me making, uh, a movie about how much it sucked to work in a video store and they're not even around anymore so uh, <laughs> that place closed a long time ago that's unfortunate uh one thing even even though like the film has like this at first like really like depression like depressing like harsh like reality uh tone to it i feel like with all your work like you know, no matter how like dark it gets like with i'm still here or direction um there's always like this sentimentality in your work and this like internal optimism mm-hmm. that like um that's almost it's it's very infectious where it's just like no matter no matter like no matter what happens in the end you know it's just like everything um it's almost like it's almost it's like it's like a Spielberg maybe influence where it's just like no matter what happens in the Spielberg movie at the end it's just like where like the world isn't that bad. I'm yeah, maybe it's a Spielberg thing. I, I'm not exactly sure. I'm trying to think of any like examples that that are similar to those kind of endings. Um, maybe Rocky. Yeah, Rocky always has that upbeat thing, but that's kind of throughout. I mean, I'm trying to think of like an ending that's like what what I really like, especially now, is kind of the bittersweet ending where, you know, life is like that, where things don't always work out exactly how you want them to. But overall, things are OK still. Um, that's kind of the the ending that I am most fond of at, at this point in my writing career, if you want to call it that. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, like some kind of optimism. I I just never like when a movie ends on a, a or a story would end on a downer just to end on a downer. Like if it makes sense for the film, then it's great. It makes sense if that's what the story is supposed to be and, and it all matches up, then yeah, that, that could still be a great ending if it's not a hundred percent positive. But um, yeah, like when it believably comes around to a positive outlook and the characters are better for going through their journey in the story um that's something I'm I'm always a big fan of. If the movie is good and if you earn the ending, that's very important. If you earn the ending where there's a positive ending or there's a positive outlook or the character gets something out of that journey that will improve his or her life going forward, then that's that's my favorite kind of ending. But you have to be on board with the character. Um, a lot of the times people you know talk about story versus character and what's more important. I'm always on the character side. Like you, you have to get a character that, you either like or at least can sympathize with on some degree or has to be extremely interesting for you to invest the time that you have to when you're watching the movie um, so you can follow their story and be interested and be invested in what they're going through. Um, People like a lot of people have the, the opposite opinion about like, you have to make sure that the story in the world and, you know, uh, everything else around the character is more important um, where I'm the opposite on that. Uh, so th- those kind of endings are, I feel like character driven endings. Um, that's definitely like in, in, I'm still, or in, um, what you call it, in, uh, infinity Trinity, there's a lot of that, uh, yeah. I feel in the ending. I definitely agree with you on that. Um, I'm, when I write, I definitely am more character based and I could care, almost care less about the plot. Right. <laughs> like, I just, I just like, I enjoy like character interactions and just like seeing how right. people, different people's like. Uh, psychologies inter- like can affect each other in that in that in, in a sense and right like, and yeah yeah absolutely and and you know when it i just love the build when there's you know like the the journey that you go on with these characters like oh this is my favorite part this is a great scene but it all it all leads to something you know um there's very few movies that i like where they're just having scenes just to have scenes or interactions that don't really mean anything uh, if it's in service of where the character or the plot is going, that's when it's always firing on, on all cylinders. Like when you get a really small moment or a really emotional moment or um, just a really strongly acted scene from whoever, um, if that leads to something else and like, you know, where, where do we go from there? Um, and it leads to a point, you know, some kind of exciting climax or emotionally exciting climax. It doesn't have to be a big fight or something, you know, it could be, um, someone leaving or, you know, some kind of um, resonance with that character where it's earned and it makes sense. So as long as things are going somewhere, 
you know, that, that, that has to be in there. I feel like too. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, so your next project that you did was the original short for the infinity Trinity, I think, right? Um, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I haven't seen that, but I always wanted to know, like, where did the idea spawn from? And then like, what was it about the Infinity Tree that made you want to do a series based off of it? Um, the original idea for Infinity Trinity, I, I can't really remember what like sparked the idea, but I, I know I wanted to do a comedy. I really wanted to do a comedy. We had never done any, any of that stuff when I was with Harry and Danny. Uh, direction is certainly not a comedy, really. I mean, there's a couple of funny elements. You could kind of see the evolution about where, you know, the parts that I focused on with infinity Trinity stuff, but um, I I definitely wanted to try out a comedy, a pure comedy. Um, So that's where that came from. And I was very influenced by like boy meets world. And again, like some of the Kevin Smith stuff, Um, but I didn't want to lose heart to the, whatever story I wanted to tell, you know, like comedies are great, but like, if there's no heart or, you know, if things that happen to the characters just don't matter at the end of it, I don't really care that that much unless it's like the three stooges, which I love, but those are, it's a unique thing. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, there's some, and then where that sentimentality comes in again, I think ties directly into infinity Trinity where I wanted to tell a story that had a lot of heart and had characters that um, I would hope the audience would care about, but tied up with like these funny situations and um humorous events that would happen in the story and things. So I think it, I don't know if it was anything specific that inspired it, but I definitely knew I wanted to do a comedy and that's kind of where we went with it. Um, yeah. I, in terms of like making it into a series, as soon as I made that, I just, I loved how it turned out. Um, I screened it at, at uh, one of my semester ending semester um, screenings in, uh, in college and like the crowd was, it was like full, it was like a full, like little theater that we had and we were all screening our stuff. And the one that went before it wasn't great. I remember everyone was very like, what the heck was that? It was one of those kind of student films. And then we put the original Infinity Trinity short film on and people were like laughing like crazy and, you know, like really, really into it. And I definitely had like friends and family in the audience, but it was only a small section. I mean, the whole audience was really into it, which I was like surprised about how much they liked it. And getting that rush of like, like, oh my goodness, they, they like the, the comedy. There's a laugh when there's supposed to be a laugh. There's even laughs when I didn't think there would be laughs, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's just like a drug, you know, if you're watching it, it's just, you know, if you're there when it's happening. Yeah. Um, so like, I think that had something to do with it. Um, but just the potential of those characters and like the ideas I had about where they could go definitely influenced my decision to make it a series. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm lucky I got to do that. I definitely owe my friends a lot for sticking with me through those couple of years that we shot all five episodes and the actors that stuck with me. I I can't say enough gracious things about them because that was a long-term project that they all stuck with me for. Yeah. It took three years. Right. Uh, just about yeah three years yeah. just for shooting yeah yeah um it's funny that like um they uh, so like uh, one of the things is like uh from the trailer that i've seen um it, it's interesting because mm-hmm. it kind of starts off as a drama and then it becomes a comedy which i think is like a cool like segue for like your artistic like interest sure sure where like well, at least from like, what the trailer gives us it's like uh i think jimmy's character is um like riley had a heart attack i think and then he, he had like a right he had like this um heart defect kind of a thing um and he can't like he can't get it like too excited that it's 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 a basic kind of like serious thing but it's a, a comedic setup for later that he he can't get too excited but he's you know i mean like he goes around eddie like my character who's a goof and mm-hmm. goes back to his hometown that kind of thing so yeah um he was the main character in that first one like solely the main character and then things kind of shifted with the series. Yeah. But um, I would like to put that up eventually because it's still, excuse me, like technically in continuity, quote unquote, with the, with the series. Like I would just call it like episode zero and I would put it up. But um, there are definitely things I would want to like go back and like fine tune a little bit and maybe have an original score made for it and then post it. Um, but I just haven't had time to, to do that yet. But luckily, 
you know, I made the series where you didn't have to see the short. So the the short film would be just like an extra pre- prequel kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like the, the series itself has, um, it's almost like a, a love letter to almost everything that you love, like you like, but it has like the Rocky references. It has like this like mid nineties sitcom feel. It also has yeah. like, like, um, like the, like the, the mob, it's like a cartoon. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, I, I think, I think, and I, I think it comes off as this, like this joyous celebration to creativity almost. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah, especially I think the best one, uh, the best episode is episode three. I yeah, a lot of people say that <laughs> the Christmas yeah. episode. And I think it's just I just think that the 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 scene where Riley is going around trying to find the necklace um, for the, for the girl and she's singing mm-hmm. the thing and she's and she's sad that like he's not there, but it's mm-hmm. just like he's 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 actually there in like more ways than one if that makes sense. Yeah. And, yeah. And then, like this, like the heart wrenching moment. The like, I think it's, it's, I think it's at the end of the episode where um, your your character's brother sees the picture of like of you two as kids, and it's just like yeah. it's just it's just a heart wrenching moment because because like we as the audience know that he's like like betraying his brother, and every like when Eddie has no idea, he's oblivious. It's just like mm. it's just it's just really really well done. Thank you. Yeah. Um... I mean, like having like that was kind of like the 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 tease at the end of the first episode is that, you know, Eddie's brother is working for Mr. Stax and, and you know, the whole mob, uh, the cartoon mob that's in that series. Um, so like the audience knows that what's going on is, you know, underhanded from that character. But Eddie is so at first very distrustful of the Ben character, but he's so desperate to have some connection to his family that he takes him in anyway and he's he becomes very innocent i really like how the eddie character turned out um just from a writing perspective not really speaking to my performance or anything um how like he evolved throughout the series is some of my favorite stuff that i've written um and his stuff with ben i i think paul paul wertak is the the actor who portrayed ben um eddie's brother um was just perfect in that role and i definitely wrote towards his strengths um so, yeah, I mean, like having the audience know that there's something going on, but like Eddie doesn't um, understand what's happening till the end. And then you you build to those moments, the moment where he finds out um, the moment where Ben comes back like that. You know, you have those moments in mind when you first start writing out that kind of storyline. Um, and, you know, the in, the in between bits getting there just need to be fun and occasionally show that Ben is sort of having a remorseful um, you know, a couple of of uh, situations when he sees Eddie and starts to second guess himself. That that all creates dramatic tension for the characters and for the audience from a different perspective because they're seeing the whole picture while the characters aren't. Yeah, um, is Jimmy a, a professional actor? Because he was also phenomenal in this in the series. Yeah, uh, he yeah, he's not a prof- I guess professional actor. I don't I don't know what I don't want to insult him. He's uh. He hasn't they, been in too many things since Infinity Trinity. Um, so I I know he wanted to try acting more when we were first doing like the short film and stuff, but he hasn't really been in too many things, um, you know, since Infinity Trinity. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, like the thing with Jimmy and with Paul and all the actors in there was that I had enough time through five episodes to... And, you know, with the short film, of course, he was in. I knew what was going to work and what wasn't going to work with them after working with them a couple times, you know. Uh, mm-hmm. I got to see what kind of lines I know they would deliver. I got to see what kind of um, situations that he could handle and what he couldn't handle. And I, I tried my my very best to play to Jimmy's strength, especially in, you know, episodes like two through five or whatever, after we got the first one out of the way. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I really... Uh, I'm proud of Jimmy and his performance in Infinity Trinity. I think uh, him playing the straight man is great. I think the, you know, like it was supposed to be like that over the top kind of uh, straight man character that you see in like sitcoms and stuff. And I think he's really good at that. Yeah. Um, what what um, what caused the film to take so long? And also, was it hard to get the uh, the channel awesome uh, crew involved? And were you writing this as you went along? Yeah, I, I wrote it as I went along. I had like an outline about about what I wanted to do, but I I think I wrote 
the first yeah it was always like writing the first episode it would be write an episode shoot the episode i would always have an outline of what i wanted to do next but i didn't write the full script until we were done shooting i think um whatever episode that we were on so um it progressed like that and that definitely was uh, a more positive way to do it because like i said i was able to adapt certain things and certain storylines to fit the actor's strengths and also i knew what as a production team with um my friend blake who shot it uh, my friend Kim, who uh, shot the first episode and was on set like the entire time, um, like a lot of that crew that I have um, that were very close to me and they're close personal friends um, that are very talented in their own right. I knew what we could handle and what we couldn't as we went along. So that was definitely a, a positive thing. Um, but uh, what was the, the second part you said? Oh, I said, why, why, why did it take so long to like get right. finished? So um, I think the main reason it took so long was that I had early cuts of like the first four episodes. They weren't like quite ready, but I was able to show like the actors and stuff and turn them in because some of them were college projects as I was going through my um, undergrad and graduate degrees. Um, So I had early cuts of those first four. The fifth one, I think I wrote out, but I started working at Channel Awesome and that was just like full on. I was I was you know, producing, editing, hosting awesome comics. I was writing, um, acting in or whatever, you know, hosting and uh, editing top five, which took a million years to put together every week because I had to watch all these movies and everything. Um, I was helping edit Tamara's Never Seen. Um, I was doing a lot like right off the bat with Channel Awesome and there was just no time to go back to Infinity Trinity for quite a while. So when things kind of calmed down a little bit, we stopped doing awesome comics uh, Tamara mostly took over editing for her show. Um, and I was just doing top five every week, which is still a ton of work, but it gave me enough time to like go back and write that fifth episode, um, or clean it up, uh, and then add in the cameos with the channel. Awesome people. Um, and it wasn't hard to include them into it. They were all on board with it. Um, and, uh, yeah, that, that was a, a lot of fun shooting that, that fifth episode. We got to really, I tried to be a little bit more ambitious and we had like different locations and, you know, with everyone's cameos and schedules, it was definitely a, a maze to kind of put together, but um, I'm really proud of how it turned out. So, yeah. Um, so, like, so you said you were doing this as a college project. Was it, uh, so, well, you were using them as college projects at, at times. Were, were, did you use this as a mm-hmm. thesis film? Um, no, I actually have, for my graduate thesis, I have a film called Owen at the Bat, which is, it went kind of back to like the sentimentality about this this kid who plays um, baseball in like a parking lot with his friends whose grandfather just passed away. And it's kind of about, you know, him getting over that. And like, there's a friend who, friend of the grandpa, who's like the mean old man who always like yells at the kids, um, who like the the main character didn't know that was his his grandfather's friend. And it's kind of about their relationship. That's a short film. Um, Harry came out to shoot that for me. when I was finishing up graduate school and I had my regular crew on that, that was done like in between Infinity Trinity shoots. I was just trying to get as much content done as I could while I had all like my friends around and like it was four college credits. Like I had to do it. So like Mm -hmm. um, I was just trying to uh, get as much different things done as I could. I don't know when I'll put that up. I mean, I'd like to, but um, that definitely needs some, some work. I was able to turn it in. Um, and, you know, with the passing grade and all that stuff, but I, I would like to put it out, but I would like to, um, you fine know, re-edit tune. some things. Yeah. Fine tune it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the, the infinity Trinity I used for the first two episodes, well, I guess like three, if you count the short film, were all college projects. So starting at the third one, um, was when it was just for me and for, you know, everyone who was working on it. Yeah. And it was during this time you were doing real reviews and then you got to work with Channel Awesome after um, mm-hmm. you interned there for at first, right? Yeah. 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 And how did you pull off getting like two shows to host on your own by like right from the get go? At Channel Awesome? Yeah. Um, well, I wasn't really planning on that. They just kind of asked me. <laughs> uh I did um like, so I interned there and was helping out just like production stuff behind the scenes on Nostalgia Critic and stuff like that. I think they had that game show that was going on at that point. Um, 
which I was helping out on a little bit here and there. And there's a couple other extra videos that weren't posted that they had me edit. Um, but yeah, that was all just like behind the scenes work, which is what I assuming what I was going to do. Um, I, you know, I, it's fun to be on camera sometimes. And, uh, I love, I really like acting, um, you know, in, in projects that I like, but I wasn't planning really to do that much with, uh, with channel awesome. So with the awesome comics thing, I think it was a, it was like an idea that they were going to do before when they raised money for when they moved into like the new studio and all that stuff. So when I came on board, Jim, uh, Jim J Roz was like really trying to push to make that show happen. And I was trying to pitch different ideas that we could, we could do it. Um, so eventually I just kind of fell into the, the hosting position with that and brought in my friend Porter, Brian Porter, who's also in infinity Trinity as well. Um, he was able to be on there and then we auditioned uh, a few people and that's where we got Ayana and Heather on board. Um, and then top five was just kind of an out of nowhere thing where my boss called me up one evening and just told me I was going to do this countdown show every week <laughs> about the top five best and worst performances, you know, of a certain actor or whatever. And later I was able to expand on it and kind of have fun with it in a different weird way. But yeah, um, yeah that was not the top five was not my idea. <laughs> yeah. initially. I was going to ask actually was like, cause like well, at some point uh, I had to, I had to like rewatch the top fives to, to for, for preparation for this. So like, but like, so was the storytelling aspect like very important for you as a, as a way to like make it not get as repetitive, like get repetitive in a way maybe. Yeah. I mean, it started to kind of get monotonous with just doing the countdowns and I, I was itching to do something creative, just anything, you know? Um, cause I think that was in between, infinity trinity things and i just wanted to shoot some original stuff so that's when heather and Ayana came on board to help write and also because i mean like the amount of research for top five is ridiculous like the like i was talking about earlier like the amount of movies and tv show episodes and all that stuff i had to watch every week for that was just crazy and i didn't want to i mean they, they were suggested to me sometimes oh you don't you can take it easy you don't have to watch all this stuff but I, I, I didn't want to half-ass that show. I wanted to watch as much as I could. I mean, there's no way I would be able to watch like every Tom Cruise movie or whatever, but I did the best I could. Yeah. I know a lot of people don't like those those specific <laughs> ones, uh, but mostly because I wasn't able, I didn't have time to watch as many as I wanted to. I mean, there are times where I was watching six movies in one day, yeah. multiple times a week. Um, so that it was just crazy. Um, yeah. So bringing on Heather and Ayana to kind of split the workload on that a little bit helped me out. And that kind of freed us up to start doing like the where's Walter thing where I went missing from the show for a while and then started doing that weird. Yeah. The Mario may stuff. And then like that weird uh, power ranger stuff we got to do with Dino Rob. So it was all just fun, goofy stuff um, that I'm I'm glad I was allowed to to do in between the the countdown segments. Yeah. Um, Why? And here's a, here's a double question is why did awesome comics get canceled? And then why did top five end Were you just burnt out of it and you wanted to focus on fan scription or. Um, With awesome comics, I think just the views weren't there. It was a very expensive show to produce. Um, Even though, I mean, you know, it it doesn't like the the set looked great, but we were shooting in our warehouse area. So the sound was kind of echoey and um, we had like this whole lighting set up. So even if it didn't always seem like it was an expensive show, it was an expensive show to, to put together because um, we had multiple people sometimes working on the lights and the audio was a constant problem on that show as well. And it just didn't justify the views we were getting for, for that series. Um, I think we started to figure it out towards the end of the run, um, like kind of like bringing up more topics instead of reviews um and debates and stuff and that was always fun to do and we were in that format so it, it just wasn't bringing in enough money to to legitimize to keep it or yeah to, to just to keep it going you know um as for top five um i think a lot of it was like was burnout um the views on that also went way down and fanscription was becoming very popular and i loved doing fanscription um it was a little bit of an easier schedule. I mean, that's, that's once a month, but a ton of work goes into fanscription um, every time we put together a video. So um, I think it was more focusing on the stuff that was working and, you know, top five kind of had trailed off a little bit at, at one point that was doing really well. And that just kind of 
you know, faded, the interest faded. You know, it's like how many count sounds can you really do <laughs> that yeah. are popular? Um, so yeah, I brought it back recently to do that Rocky countdown, but um it would still be fun to, you know, once in a while to come back and do a countdown. Um, but it's definitely not something I'm gonna do every week anymore. Yeah, with fanscription, and I, from what I, I think you, you mentioned why you did it was because you wanted to, you desperately wanted to say, do the story of why Apollo didn't die, and and what if Paul, Apollo didn't die in four? Yeah, was that the genesis of it? Yeah, that was wow. yeah. So it, it's a funny story how like the full show came together. So I think in, I think the show started in 2018. So I think I pitched it in like spring 2018. Uh, like a what if show. And originally I was going to do it just on my channel. I really just wanted to do that Apollo one. And I love what ifs and, you know, you know, characters that are established and kind of changing things. That's why I love like the Elseworlds comics from DC and the, what if some of the, some of the what ifs comics from Marvel and stuff. Um, I just love the the concept of that kind of stuff. So I brought it up that I was, yeah, I'm probably gonna make this on my channel, but um, they were really interested in it when I brought it up over here. So um, I said, okay, but I, I want the first one to be the what if Apollo Creed didn't die in Rocky four. And I wanted to wait to release that until that November, which is when Creed two was coming out. And I kind of wanted to match that up. And, you know, the interest in the Rocky series would be um, not a, maybe not at an all time high, but, you know, people are going to be talking about it at that point because the Creed movie was coming out. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's when I was aiming to come out with the show. But um, during that in between time, Rob like randomly messaged me. I think they did. They reviewed like Ghostbusters two or something on Nostalgia Critic, and Doug did a little segment that he said, uh, "There, I fixed the movie." Where he like kind of went through Ghostbusters two and suggested a couple things that could have fixed it. So Rob came to me after that and was like, "You know, I really got an, a great idea for a show, and I would love love your help with it if we could team up. Um, basically, like you know, a, a a fix flicks show where you go through." movies and and you know improve them um you know like with big franchises and stuff and the first one he wanted to do was uh return of the jedi and um i said that's hilarious because i already pitched that almost exact same show <laughs> to our boss before um and uh we just kind of pooled our resources on that and uh, i think rob came up with the fanscription name um i came up with like the tone of the show and i edited all the episodes and Jim helped me shoot the the intro with the typewriter, which I still think is like a really cool, slick, short oh, opening. Yeah, yeah I, I really like how that turned out. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I came up with like the basics of the show and everything around it. Rob had a similar idea, and we kind of combined some things um, to, you know, finally come off, uh, come out with it every month, and sort of switching back and forth writing for that first year and a half. Um, Rob slowed down on it, but he's still working on it when. Uh, when he has an idea or um, a lot of the times these past couple months, he gives me um, Photoshop images that he puts together that we use for like concept art and stuff. Yeah. Uh, what was the most creative fulfilling one? Was it the Apollo Creed one or was it, I, I assume for, for at least Rob, it was Batman forever. Yeah. Batman forever was one that I also was, that I was on the list from the very beginning. <laughs> um, but he, I mean like he's, he was around, when the Nolan movies or when the uh, Burton movies were out. So, I mean, I was, you know, born the year before that the movie came out, but I wasn't able to go to the theater. I was like a baby. So yeah. <laughs> he, he like can remember being in there and, and, you know, as it came out, he was, he was uh, old enough to remember all that stuff. So he has a real fondness for him. I love the Burton movies as well, but he like was deep in there. So we, when we, he first did his, uh, what if Harvey Dent, um, you know, turned to two face and, or what if Harvey Dent was in Batman returns episode, the sequel to that, we wanted to make Batman forever. And I had like a loose idea for it. So we kind of combined on that one. So that was really creatively fulfilling because that one's an hour, 40 minutes. It's like a full movie length <laughs> that mm -hmm. we put together. Um, that was crazy yeah. trying to edit that. Um, I, I love that one. I, that I've, I, I really love that one. Um, I was hosting a Batman podcast not too long ago and we were, we, before we canceled it, uh, we were actually going to do a review of that. Uh, oh man. <laughs> um, and it's funny cause like, I, I, I didn't expect to, I, I, that I was going to like it as much as I'm like, I'm like, uh, one of the five people that really defend Batman forever being really great. But like you, I, you, you really nailed it. And it was like, it was way better than Batman forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like that. I'm glad that we got to work together on that. Like Rob really had a 
I think I had like the outline and then Rob got to add, he added the, all the Rid- the Riddler stuff was all Rob. And um, like a lot of the things he just filled in from like an earlier version that I had. So that, that was a true um, collaborative effort. That's like one of the only ones that we worked on the story together for. Um, so that was definitely one of the most creatively fulfilling and also just editing and yeah, like the moving parts and everything that we had to do to put that together. Rob made like, uh, hundreds or something of, of images for that. So we'd be like messaging each other at two o'clock in the morning on Facebook or something, um, going back and forth. I'm like, Hey, go to bed, man. It's like two o'clock. Like, yeah, we got to get this done for this certain date. And I think it got pushed back like one week because I was trying to, you know, put it in bat may, but then it came out like, you know, the first day of, uh, you know, June or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that, that's definitely like as an overall perspective, like maybe my favorite one um, in terms of just creatively. Uh, but I also love the, how the back to the future four one turned out. I didn't expect people to watch that one as much as they did, but that, that one's got like a big uh, view count and a, a lot of comments from like big YouTubers, which is like kind of crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, that That's one of my favorites as well. But yeah, it all started with that Rocky yeah. four one. That's still one I, I think turned out really well. It's also yeah. a, like the shortest episode too. So it's easy to watch. <laughs> I loved the Back to the Future 4 one as well. Um, me and my buddy who, like, uh, we, we like we, as soon as I came out, I was just like, because he's a huge Back to the Future nerd, I was like, hey, man, you got to watch this because this, this guy knows how to like, make what-if sequels. And he was, he was blown away by it. He was just like, that is all I could have asked for in a Back to the Future sequel. That's awesome. I'm so glad people like that one because, I mean, that was one of those that I didn't think people were going to be that into. I just wanted to make it just to make it. And like, you know, what if they did make a four, how I would do it. And, you know, that, that, that one really, uh, a lot of people really like that. So thank you for, uh, for saying that. Like a lot of back to the future people, a lot of big fans of the the series, um, mostly really like it. So, I mean, I'm, you know, blown away by the, uh, the support and the nice comments from everyone on that one. Yeah. Um, are you guys, are you and Rob still working on what if, uh, Tim Burton did Batman and Robin? Yeah. I mean, uh. I have like an idea for it uh, and that's going to be out at some point next year. So that's going to be another super long one. Um, so <laughs> you can look forward to that. I, hopefully I'll have some more time to work on it because I was finishing up Batman as I was going right into the Batman forever stuff. And that was an insane schedule for a few weeks. <laughs> yeah. So, that, uh, yeah. <laughs> that was my next question. What started Batman and Twilight Tober zone? And would you consider doing the storytelling aspects for Batman, or is it just strictly for the Twilight Tober zone? Um, there was, you know, I, I didn't really want to do any storytelling elements for Batman. That was always just me talking about the show because I love it so much and have, you know, I have like Batman animated the book that's like has a bunch of behind the scenes information about it. Um, I have all the, I have the DVDs and the Blu-ray set. <laughs> so like I have all these commentary tracks and, I know uh, or I have access to a lot of the behind the scenes information about a lot of those episodes. I've also been in contact with some of the, the, the directors about possibly being interviewed for next year. I tried to get them on this year, but it just didn't work out for scheduling for them. Um, so I won't do like story elements for Batman like I do with Twilight Zone, but there might be an opportunity to interview some of the directors of the episodes, which would be freaking awesome. So I hope that happens. Yeah. And was this like something you pitched to Channel Awesome or was this like something that they were like, Walter, we know you love Batman. We want to talk about Batman for an entire month? Um, this, yeah, this one was my idea where it was like I wanted to do that from a while ago, but it, we just couldn't fit it in with all the other work I was doing. Um, but then like with the pandemic starting, um, you know, we didn't know where we were going to be with, you know, like the revenue or we didn't know how it was going to work. Like were people going to totally tune out? Like what was going to happen? So that's kind of when I volunteered to do Batman just so we'd have another month. Cause we already had Disney December, which Doug posts a Disney review every month or every day in December. So I thought, yeah, let me, let me do that bat uh, Batman idea uh, for May and we'll just call it Batman. And it's like yeah. an easy way to, you know, put together the month and the name. So um, that's where that came from. And I was able to, to do all that uh, from home. Like I didn't, you know, I didn't need to shoot anything on camera. Uh, it was all narration and writing from home and editing from home. So that was, those were easy to put together, but hard to, um, you know, like as a, as a whole, it was, it took a long time to put those all out. 
Yeah. Um, so one, one of the questions I wanted to ask about Channel Awesome is like, this is more from like a perspective of someone who's like, like, like how to deal with criticism is like, how do you, how do you handle being in like a video or something that gets heavily criticized? Does it like hurt? Like, does it affect you like personally or do you just brush it off? Is this like, well, you know, we messed up a project, but you know, it's on to the next one. It, it's tough. I, you know, I don't know if I've ever made a, a video of mine that I like wrote and acted in and stuff that's been like lamb blasted or whatever. I think that's one of the, the good things about not being the nostalgia critic is I'm not like the lead person on the channel. So I could experiment and do different things. And if anyone really hates something, you know, it's not like seen by as many people. So um, I've never had like something that I considered a failure really. Um, but it is always like on to the next thing. So, um, there's so much, so much work and so many videos that I've been put, I think this year alone, I put out like over like 80 videos or something. Um, so it's been an insane amount of work. So there's not a lot of time to dwell on those negative comments, but sometimes you get caught up. I think like for Batme, I, I was trying to pronounce like a name, like a, in, in the, um, night of the ninja episode, I think, um, or day of the samurai, one of those two where like there's a, a Japanese name that I tried my best to pronounce, but someone got really mad that I mispronounced it. And I was like going back and forth in comments. It's never a good look. <laughs> it's never a good look to like respond to someone who doesn't like your stuff. I mean, there's a difference to someone who's criticizing it or constructively criticizing or like, I didn't like this. You should have done this or this to someone just being a jerk, which does happen sometimes. Um, it's it's really hard for me to not take things personally sometimes if someone's just being a, a jerk to be a jerk. Um, if someone's over the top, just like swearing at me in the comments, which happens sometimes, that's easy to brush off because it's like, yeah, whatever. But sometimes if someone really didn't like a certain aspect and then attacks you personally, sometimes that could really get under my skin. I'm trying still to work on that to like just let that go. But like I said, luckily, there's always something else to work on where I can move on and not worry about um you know, a video that came out the the previous week or month. Yeah, I've 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 struggled with that in the past as my, myself. I remember I was at for one of my short films that I I I was at a film fe- it was at a film festival, mm-hmm. and the subject matter was a little tense. But like this, we we were outside. Like I I usually wait outside because I can't watch my own thing in a theater full of people. It's too nerve wracking. Yeah. But yeah, uh. Too. But like this lady came out after the movie and was just like, "You scumbag!" and spit at my feet, and I was like, "Oh my god!" Whoa, what? <laughs> yeah, I was like, "Spit Jesus. at your feet!" Yeah, I was just like, "Okay." Jeez, I mean, I, I guess, I guess, I guess so. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely like it's 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 always tough. It, it's just like it's just a piece of art, you know. It's not like I'm, I'm right. tr- we're part, and it's, he's not like you you mess you, know, you mispronouncing a name, but personally attacking you. It's it's always like it's a like crazy how people can react yeah i've never experienced that in person man that's a i haven't even gone through that so i mean it's always through through comments for me so i'm I'm sorry that sucks that you had to to go through that it's fine but um so i i don't want to take up too much of your time so i want to ask to to close out the the the, um the the episode is uh what what are you working on next what what, what's your dream project like what what's what what what, do you have another film coming or another series um in terms of what I'm working on next, I mean, it's there's a lot of personal stuff that's going on next year where I'm not going to be able to put out quite as much as I was this year. Um, but I'll be able to put out Twilight Zone stuff and Batman still. But um, yeah, I mean, there's I have so many ideas for stories and scripts and concepts that I would love to make. Um, but, you know, people like my friends and everyone who helped me make Infinity Trinity and some of the other projects are, you know, everyone's older now. They're, they have other jobs or you know, they, they kind of fell out of the filmmaking thing. Um, but I would love to do something. I don't know about next year, but maybe 2023, I'll be able to make another film. I, I just really want to make something from like the ideas that I have. I would love to just start writing like those ideas out into full scripts or just stories or whatever. It's just tough when there's, there's so much work to do. Cause I, on, you know, on the internet, you got to pump out as much stuff as possible. Um, and that's what I've been doing these past two years with, but, you know, two monthly shows, which, you know, was a lot. I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I probably should have waited till Batman was over to do Twilight Zone stuff. But, you know, I'm not going to go back on it now. Um, 
So it, it's just trying to find the time to work on those personal projects. That's, I mean, I still love doing fanscriptions. Those are like half personal projects because they're original stories, but they're based on other things. Um, but I would love to, to film something again, to write a full script, work on it for a really long time, really push what I haven't been able to, you know, do before and, and really make something to be proud of. So that's what I'd really like to do, but it's probably not going to be possible in, until at least like 2023, unfortunately. It's unfortunate, but I look forward to seeing whatever you uh, you make next. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. All right, that's gonna that's gonna wrap this episode up. Thank you, thank you so much for doing this.